This session we're kicking off this afternoon is Accelerating Innovative Solutions to Decarbonize Transportation. Please welcome to the stage President, Center of Climate and Energy Solutions, Nat Cohane. Thanks very much. Welcome, everybody. It's great to see everyone here. I'm Nat Cohan, the president of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that accelerates the transition to a thriving, just, and resilient net zero economy. Um, we're here today to talk about the transportation sector, which accounts for about a quarter of all global emissions, 25%. And for many countries, including the US, the sector is the largest source of emissions. So clearly, decarbonizing all modes of transportation is a key aspect of reaching net zero. Businesses are more focused than ever on developing and deploying new solutions and taking real action now that show that deep dark decarbonization in the sector is possible. Today we'll be talking with four companies that have a commitment to reduce emissions across different modes of transportation. We'll dive into what steps they have taken to date, what challenges they face, and the possible solutions that might be needed in the coming years. But to kick us off, I'm very pleased to introduce Ali Zaidi to provide some opening remarks. Ali serves as the president, the assistant to the president and the national climate advisor in the White House. In this role, he leads the White House Climate Policy Office, which coordinates policy development and President Biden's all of government approach to tackle the climate crisis. Please welcome Ali Zaidi. The panel that you're gonna hear from, I think is a manifestation of the breadth of our ambition when it comes to transportation in the Biden-Harris administration. When we think about the jobs possibilities, the manufacturing potential, our ability to pull the pollution out of the sky and make our communities healthier and more sustainable, we don't just think about light-duty vehicles or heavy-duty vehicles. We think about rail and marine and aviation, and increasingly, None of that is hypothetical. It's actually fuel in the tank or tires on the road. And the companies you're gonna hear from are translating uh, what is a historic set of investments across the infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act that put the economic possibility within the reach of more and more firms and more and more families. Folks, we stand at a moment when sustainable aviation um, just a few years ago was a laboratory experiment. Uh, but today, commercial flights are moving from point A to point B with commercial fuel manufactured in a way that helps us bend the curve in an industry that is increasingly responsible for emissions in the transportation sector. We see in heavy-duty transportation a part of what moves on our roads and highways solutions starting to appear all across the country. I was actually with Amazon as they rolled out their biggest purchase of trucks at the Port of LA, a massive investment in vehicles that are actually being manufactured in the United States. In fact, one of the joys of my job, as I think back to the last three and a half years, past the Inflation Reduction Act, past the infrastructure law, and then drive a American-made, union-made semi at the White House, uh, is right up there on the list. Um, the reason why I think this is such a powerful area for all of us to lean into of course, the emissions piece of it is massive, right? Uh, this, the transportation sector, is now the largest sector of emissions for the United States. And when you look out around the world, uh, it is the opportunity that more and more countries are running to seize. But it's not just a massive deal for climate change, it's a massive public health opportunity. Think about this, last year, the world suffered from $8 trillion of public health costs 
because of the pollution that went into the sky. And think about where those particulates and where those criteria pollutants are normally coming from. They're coming from the burning of diesel. And so our chance to pivot to the fuels of the future in transportation is a really big one. Um, there's another, I think, massive opportunity embedded in the transportation sector of the future. And that's the opportunity not just to put cars on the road or steel in the ground, but to invest in rebuilding the American middle class and to inspire hope in a generation that desperately needs it. Across our country, young people are growing up thinking that it's normal that the sky turns orange, that they have to put on masks to prevent them from breathing in wildfire smoke from hundreds of miles away. They're accustomed to the dreadful push alerts on their phone that another hurricane or another flood has gotten turbocharged by warmer water. They have all the reason in the world to feel dreadful, to feel despair, to feel hopeless. But when that yellow school bus shows up at the end of the driveway and it's no longer pumping pollution into the sky, no longer the roar of the diesel engine, when they're able to walk by the port, not having to breathe in a bunch of fumes, they know that we have prioritized them, and they feel a sense of hopefulness. Just like the workers in Georgia, unionized now together, making those electric school buses, or the workers, the steel workers at refineries now manufacturing that sustainable aviation fuel, everybody recognizes that this could be a story that ends in despair, but if we take action, if we come together, if we stand for the solutions, it could be a story that ends not just in us taking emissions out of our inventory, but in us restoring the American middle class and putting hope in the tank. So whether it's the folks taking the wind in Texas and turning it into fuel to ship across channels, uh, or the companies that are investing in a zero emission freight network in the United States and building out charging as essential, or it's the companies that are on the frontier of reinventing the American passenger vehicle experience and experience of choice, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, hydrogen fuel cell, fully electric, um, all of these companies, I think, are taking up the mantle of not just doing what's necessary by our climate, but what's necessary for our society. Uh, and this is hopefully, I think, an easier task made monumentally easier economically and in terms of enabling infrastructure by the historic legislation passed by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. The president yesterday said it so well. He said, we've changed the equation. We've recentered climate action around economic opportunity. And he closed out with a challenge, which I'll leave not only for the panelists, but for all of you. This is our chance to go big. We have no excuse to hold back. There's $6 trillion of cash sitting on the sidelines. Help these companies scale. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ali. So now I'd like to invite our panelists up to the stage, and I'll introduce them as they come. Uh, we've got a great panel, uh, again, across modes of transportation. Ashley De La Torre, the Vice President for Public Policy at Amazon. Uh, Lena Bjorn Serpa, the Head of Corporate Sustainability at AP Mahler Maersk. Omar Vargas, who is the Vice President and Head of Global Public Policy at General Motors. And Tom Michaels, the Director of Government Affairs at United Airlines. Thanks so much for being here. Um, C2S does a lot of work with companies. Three of you all are on our business council. Really pleased to be having this conversation today. And thanks to Amazon for, for arranging it and, and to the Nest for hosting this, this really important conversation. So 
we've talked, I, I talked a little bit in the intro about the importance of transportation. I think we all know that. We heard some great remarks from Ali about the role, uh, the, the broader context, the role of the federal government. Um, but here, of course, we're talking about the role of corporate action. And so maybe can each of you share uh, a little bit about your company's sustainability commitments and maybe give us one kind of what's a big headline from the last year in your decarbonizing, uh, de decarbonization journey. And Ashley, maybe I can start with you. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for, for being here today to talk about this, what we, we know is a crisis and a very important issue. Um, for Amazon, we are uh, deeply committed to tackling this. We've made some really big, uh, ambitious goals. We've um, announced we will be net zero carbon by 2040, so 10 years ahead of the Paris Agreement. We don't yet know how we're going to get there, but we know it's going to take uh, partnerships so we've invited uh, other companies to join us in that journey. We co-founded the Climate Pledge and are making progress, steady progress towards those goals. We um, made a pledge to, be, to match 100% of our energy across our operations, so that's our fulfillment centers, our data centers, our corporate offices, with renewable energy. Our goal was to do that by 2030, and we, we got there seven years ahead of schedule, so we're very excited about that. We're the uh, largest corporate uh, purchaser of renewable energy uh, for the fourth year in a row. Uh, in the transportation space, we've made some bold commitments. Uh, we have 15,000 electric delivery vehicles on the road today and growing. And I guess over the last year, the, the, the biggest headline, well, Ali uh, mentioned one of those that I was going to mention. That's our, our 50 new Class A uh, heavy-duty trucks that are we're deploying in Southern California, a big one. Um, I'm also super excited about uh, drone delivery, which is currently running for our customers in College Station and will be expanding to cities in the, in the years ahead. Terrific. Thanks. Uh, Lena, how about Maersk? Yeah, thank you so much. And also, also, first of all, thank you so much for inviting us uh, to be part of this important conversation. So uh, Maersk, uh, of course, uh, a global shipping and logistics uh, company. And um, we, back in 2018, uh, set a, uh, a net zero uh, goal as the first in, uh, in uh, our uh, industry. And also back then, we were actually quite clear on saying, we don't know how we're going to get there, but we know we need to get to, uh, to zero, net zero. Um, since then, what we've actually found is uh, it's actually possible. Uh, it, it's not so much, we thought this was a moonshot, it's still a moonshot, but it's not a technical problem. We actually know the solutions uh, that will get us uh, to zero, um, but, uh, but we know that we also need to accelerate e even faster. We have uh, in the past, uh, very recent years, and also uh, in collaboration or in response to Amazon's call, among uh, others with the Climate uh, Pledge, also moved up our uh, ambitions to say by 2040 we will be net zero. And we've also, uh, to the point, uh, your point of what uh, to highlight in particular from the last year, I think there's two things that I want to in particular highlight. One uh, is that uh, we now also have a validated science-based target. 1.5 degree aligned uh, for 2030 and uh, net zero by 2040. Uh, and uh, and uh, to the point that it can be done, we actually now also have the vessels on the water. Uh, so the uh, investments that we've started to make in dual fuel vessels that can sail on green methanol uh, and uh, in the future also uh, uh, green uh, 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 LNG, bio, biomethane. Uh, in the, in further on, it will be other technologies like ammonia, et cetera. But they're, but they're now a reality, and they're on the water. And, and uh, we have uh, five uh, in the fleet so far. It's just the beginning. Um, but uh, the big challenge, and I'm sure we'll come back to that uh, later in this conversation, is, of course, how do we, how do we really achieve scale? Yeah, and we definitely will come back to that scale question. Yeah. Omar, how about you, GM's commitments, and what are the headlines? Sure, the head, I think the big headline is that we are well on our way towards our uh, fulfilling our vision of uh, zero emissions, uh, zero congestion, and zero crashes. Uh, our, our goal, stated out several years ago now, is to reach 100% uh, EV fleet by 2035. We're well on that way, and maybe I'll pick up uh, where Ali uh, left off with respect to clean energy 
tax credits, the Inflation Reduction Act, and industrial policies like this, which um, uh, not just validate the path that General Motors is on, but helps us to accelerate that transition. And so what we've worked on, and maybe it's the sub-headline for the last year, has been building out an incredibly complicated EV value chain uh, to ensure that we have uh, the capability to bring the EVs to scale uh, for the North American market uh, and ensure that they are at all affordable levels and all performance levels. But also, probably more critically, what we're learning is the importance of onshoring and nearshoring, mm -hmm. the importance of global competitiveness, both in the technology and the design of the vehicle, we're learning about consumer preferences. Uh, and, and look, we, we, we never expected the EV market to be just a straight arrow going up. There will always be uh, ups and downs, valleys and peaks, and that's what we're seeing now. And we're well positioned to navigate across um, that line that will ultimately continue to increase. Last point here, and probably the most important point in all of this, um, is that as we are transforming our product portfolio, we are bringing our workforce and the communities around our plants along with us. So the investments are happening right where our ICE uh, uh, vehicle investments and capital exists today, so that we are training workers, we're developing that workforce, and again, more importantly, we're ensuring that the community continues to thrive around GM's footprint. Terrific, Tom. So uh, United Airlines, um, we have made our sort of stretch goal uh, that we'll achieve net zero emissions by 2050 without reliance on traditional carbon offsets. And um, that's a pretty tough thing for an airline to do. Um, unlike uh, many industries, we are not particularly amenable to electrification. Uh, while we may be able to electrify some of our short haul flights, uh, 200 miles or less, um, the the vast bulk of our emissions come from our long haul uh, transatlantic flights. And so we really need to continue to use liquid fuels for those uh, because there's really no technology on the drawing board that would ever have a sufficiently strong battery to get you over there with the weight ratio, energy to weight ratio necessary. So we're, we're trying to change our fuels. Um, in terms of how we're doing that, um, we, we done a lot of direct investment. We're the largest uh, U.S. consumer of sustainable aviation fuel. Um, we've seen our, our own usage go from uh, about a million gallons a year to now uh, around 10 times that. Um, and the industry broadly has followed a similar trajectory. And so we're, we're pretty excited about that. Of course, we use 4 billion gallons a year, not million. And so um, we're going to need to <laughs> We're going to need to make that growth rate go even higher. Um, and so, you know, what am I excited about? How are we doing it? You know, I think everybody in this audience knows the financing challenges. One of our ways to, to help solve them is public policy. And we're working collaboratively on public policy. Uh, we, we, we launched a coalition called the SAF Coalition, SAF being Sustainable Aviation Fuel. Um, we, we have uh, well over 50 companies, including our friends at Amazon joining, thank you, and, um, and uh, as well as, you know, large agribusiness interests, energy interests, SAF producers, technology providers, uh, re refineries, um, a very broad based sector, labor unions as well have, have come on board with this coalition. And that, that officially launched as its own standalone entity in 2023. It's something we're really excited about, very focused on helping implement the policies that'll help us achieve these, these very challenging goals that we all share. Thanks, I, you know, I pick out a couple of themes from that. I mean, one, um, you all mentioned these goals that are really ambitious, right? And, uh, and you're not sure how to meet them, but you're working from today to figure out, well, let's get started and make the investments. And I think we've done a little bit of work on transition plans. That's where we come down, is a strategy needs to be the north star of where we need to go. That's driven by Paris, science, driven by Paris. And that's going to be really hard. And then making the investments today that get us started on that and a plan, knowing that between now and 2040, 2050, there's going to be a lot of learning and a lot of things to, to do. Um, but I also really take away some of the points around, I love the example of there are five ships on the water. That's something I've heard a lot about this, this week. Investments that are being made 
this is real, it's, it's happening in a way that maybe five or 10 years ago is hypothetical. Um, well, uh, Omar, let me go to you. You mentioned the, uh, in, the importance of building out your supply chain and your value chain to meeting your goals. I'm interested in hearing a little bit more of that and, and also you know, what can other companies learn from that? Maybe obviously every company is, is different, but you've learned so much. I'm, I'm curious about that experience and where you, how you think that might uh, uh, help provide lessons for others. So you know, I, I, for us, it's in my mind, uh, our biggest lesson is the important role that public sector and government plays in the public policy sort of apparatus that supports the value chain development. I think very much to, to his points here about uh, the role that government must play in all of this. Um, it, it, when we set out the policy environment, and may I speak from a perspective where we're a heavily regulated industry, um, so as we work with our regulators and we work on implementation of legislation like the Inflation Reduction Act, there are still significant pieces of trade relationships that need to be architected uh, and entered into. Um, there are geopolitical concerns around supply chain resiliency and sustainability. Um, and all of that requires governmental involvement and dialogue between our government and industry and understanding what industry's needs are and then government dialogue with trade partners and allies about building those supply chains to ensure that we can onshore or nearshore as great as possible um, the materials, the products that we need. Technology is another important piece. Uh, and we need to ensure that we're uh, engaging the R&D to get to the battery uh, chemistries and the battery technology that is very much needed for electric vehicles, but also help to bring the cost of that down. And so, for example, the Department of Energy has done a great deal of work in collaboration with industry to do battery R&D to support through grants and loans and development of not just battery R&D, but battery manufacturing facilities, and all that helps to drive the economics to a better place, which then ultimately leads to uh, affordable vehicles. Well, you know, Omar, both you and Tom have mentioned policy, and so let me, let's, let's maybe dig into that a little bit, and maybe, Ashley, I can turn to you. From Amazon's point of view, what recent policies or incentives have been effective in driving decarbonization investments and innovations from your perspective, and, and what else do we need? We always, you know, in the NGO world, we're always celebrating the policies that we've got, but we also want to focus on what else we need, particularly for the transportation sector. So how do you see what's working and, and what more do we need? Well, I, um, I think I, I'm super thrilled about the policy tailwinds we have right now, and Omar talked a little bit about them in the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the IRA. Those are helping companies like Amazon uh, look at all different ways to reduce emissions. So that can be in uh, electrification, uh, and you know we're, we're looking at it not just for us, but also throughout our supply chains, who, where we're working with companies and with organizations. So electrification of ports and airports, super important that there's policies allowing for that. Um, policies that are jump-starting um, electric vehicle manufacturing, uh, installation of charging uh, technology. Um, those are just the, the few things that we're seeing right now that are really pushing companies to make those investments. Um, I think I heard Ali mention it briefly, but the administration's um, Z National Zero Emission Freight Corridor, really important to bring private sector investment for uh, corridor charging. If I had to think about what else, um, again, Tom mentioned it, but how are we encouraging more um, production of sustainable aviation fuel? Amazon uses all modes of transportation in our global mile where we're needing green, uh, green freight corridors for maritime shipping to aviation. We have Amazon um, uh, Amazon Air. We're move, moving packages via air, so we need more sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, and also uh, low, more low carbon fuels for last mile delivery. We're investing in electric vehicles, but also need uh, some policies that will continue to encourage lo um, states uh, to, to really focus on uh, ways to green uh, our last mile transportation. Now, I'm glad you mentioned the, the fuels piece, and Tom, of course, you talked about that too. The IRA was so enormous in terms of clean power and clean electricity. It did have other, lots of other provisions in it, mm -hmm. but some of the, the SAF provisions, the sustainable aviation fuel provisions, actually have a much shorter time horizon. So how do we push them out a little bit, give that the same runway as some of those others? So clearly more to be done there. Let me 
let me go to Le you, Lena. You have, obviously, Maersk has a bit of an international perspective. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a whole set of policies that I know are going on globally as well as in the U.S., International Maritime Organization. Um, I think relative to some other sectors, maritime, you know, the policies maybe haven't gone quite as fast in maritime, but I know there's lots of activity, lots of thinking. What policies or incentives do you see as essential to net zero goals for, for maritime? Yeah, so, uh, so that's right. The, the, so the maritime industry is, is, is quite unique in that it's globally regulated uh, through the International Maritime Organization, which is a UN uh, body. So all the member states of the UN are actually you know, responsible for voting in the International Maritime Organization and determining the, the regulatory conditions for the, for the industry, including uh, a greenhouse gas strategy uh, and, uh, and super importantly, what is being uh, determined uh, actually uh, in this particular, this week and next week in the IMO in London, there's meetings uh, going on uh, to discuss uh, introducing a market-based measure, uh, in effect a, a, a carbon price uh, for, uh, for international uh, shipping. Uh, it's not a final decision that's being made, that is expected in April next year, but this is really so critical for our industry because what we see now is that, as I mentioned, we can take the steps of uh, investing in the, in the vessels, um, so, so making it possible, showing it can be done. Um, but ultimately, so the challenge is that the, the, the green fuels, the low emission fuels that we need, continue to be three or four times more expensive than fossil fuels. Uh, and our customers, even though we, we do have uh, some uh, front-runner customers, including, fortunately, Amazon and, and others, uh, who uh, are willing to pay a premium uh, for, uh, for low-emissions shipping, but we can't expect every single customer to take that price individually. Um, so that's why we need policies in place to actually level the playing field so that the right choice can also be the, you know, the affordable choice for, for all of us, basically. Um, so uh, so that's, that's really the opportunity that the, uh, in this case, the, uh, the, the, uh, all of our governments uh, have to put in place this, uh, this pricing mechanism that can uh, um, uh, level that playing field. And actually, we have as MASC, um, uh, we're supporting uh, a particular measure that's put forward uh, by the World Shipping Council, which is uh, called the Green Balance Mechanism. So there's various proposals on the table, but this one we think is a particularly good one because it um, has, uh, for one thing, uh, consideration of not uh, introducing an overly high uh, price, uh, carbon price, uh, all at once. I think that could have some some inflationary, perhaps, uh, consequences, for example. And there's also considerations on just transition. I think you were also referring to the need to make sure that the transition is also uh, socially, uh, let's say, acceptable, uh, ultimately, right? And the just transition element is that uh, the proposal includes a, a proposal for a, a just transition fund so that the uh, proceeds from such a, a carbon price would actually benefit developing countries to support them on the on the transition. So, uh, so ultimately, it is this. It's absolutely critical that we uh, that we get such a price uh, in, uh, in in place for the industry to decarbonize. Ultimately. And and what an, and such an interesting kind of global solution, yes. right, for a truly global industry. And one you can imagine how powerful that price signal yes. could be mm. uh, in driving innovation, but also also providing funds for for that mm. transition. Um, so, Tom, let me let me go to you. You you mentioned policy as well, but I know you've also been working at the kind of intersection of policy and finance, being critical to decarbonization. Um, I'm interested. United, you've got direct action in that. You're you're sort of walking the walk with uh, an in-house sustainability focused venture fund aimed at financing decarbonization. So, as you get into that directly, uh, what are the some of the pain points you're seeing? What are the opportunities you're seeing? So there are a ton of pain points. Um, in general, uh, making fuels is very expensive and low margin business uh, subject to high risk. And a lot of the technologies are, are, are unproven, untested. And to really get the financing for them, people want to see a thousand hours of uninterrupted operation from these new technologies. That's going to take some time, right? So I think the, again, the, the pain points are pretty well understood. We need more money 
and we need, <laughs> on, a, on a grand scale, we need an appetite for risk that, that most banks really aren't allowed to have. Um, but we're seeing a lot of, a lot of really uh, bright points. You know, we, we should be happy warriors in this uh, fight, and, and I think we are. We set up uh, United Airlines Ventures, um, that's our, our in-house corporate venture fund, and so we're going out and we're, you know, scouring the earth literally for new technologies, new and uh, new startups that are doing things not only specifically, for example, in fuels or in um, more efficient aircraft, but uh, a, along the whole value chain of that proposition. And so anything, you know, we we've invested in battery makers, we've invested in a, a company that is making. Um, uh, butter, actually, um, but but from a novel process that could be used in the fuel production process. Um, and so all of these new fuels and new technologies, they need a variety of sort of potential revenue sources, so we're trying to help them get started. Um, and then uh, there's our sustainable flight fund. After we started United Airlines Ventures, um, we which is sort of broadly focused, and it's electric aircraft, hydrogen. We're throwing everything at the wall, and we're going to wait and see what sticks. Uh, but the Sustainable Flight Fund is, broad, is, is focused on, on the fuel value chain, and we've got um, about 18 limited partners that are a part of that, um, over $200 million in capital, and some really exciting investments that we're seeing. And then as I mentioned, our coalition is working on the broader policy piece that we think will shake loose a bit more of that funding. And that's, uh, it's probably going to be a blend of, of carrots, like we've seen with the Inflation Reduction Act, and probably some hopefully well-constructed, thoughtful sticks on the other side of it <laughs> um, that will help drive investment in this space and uh, foster an ecosystem of, of climate success. And you know. What we're hearing is so exciting. This stuff is really cool, right? Yeah. Well, that so so we've talked about we've talked about policy. We've talked about the corporate action. Talked a little bit about finance. Um, but in some ways, this all comes down to the customer. Um, and so I'm interested in the role of the of customers and and consumers in how you all think about this. And maybe Omar, I can go to you. Um, how does GM think about changing consumer preferences and behavior patterns, and how do those impact your strategies and your investments? Um, again, sort of new opportunities, but also what, what challenges uh, arise, and, and how does that feed back into the policies that we need? Yeah. You know what's great about GM is that we make vehicles, products that people love and want, and like, you know, how many country hit songs today on the radio have Chevrolet mentioned in them or you know GM vehicle. It's 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 fantastic. That's what we do best and we and we we really focus on on the customer. At the center the customer is at the center of everything that we do. Um, for us, uh, or at least our, our view on the biggest sort of throttle back on customer adoption is range anxiety. Hmm. So understanding, hey, can I get to where I need to go? Can I charge my vehicle? And so that raises questions about the charging infrastructure. A lot of investment, a lot of energy going behind building out a national charging infrastructure, public sector investment, private sector investment, GM investment in partnerships with other companies to help build that out. But it's not keeping up, or hasn't kept up pace with where we need to be in terms of volumes. And so, you know, customers, again, are at the center of all of this. If they're not buying the vehicles, then we're not really advancing our adoption goals. And so how do we get customers uh, to be very interested and to make that commitment to buy the vehicle? It's having the charging infrastructure in place. And so hopefully, you know, I, I heard, you know, Ali's, Ali knows this very well. I mean, we've got to get a, the, the government machinery moving powerfully and quickly um, to help advance that charging infrastructure. We have to work with a variety of different other business sectors uh, to ensure that charging is at where the charging customers or clients are whether it be work or entertainment, vacation, tourism, et cetera, that all needs to be there um, you know, for, that, for, for one to feel like, hey, I can make this kind of investment. Um, I think the second piece is also from our consumer insights, it's the overall general narrative around uh, EVs. And I think it's, it'll be super important to, um, uh, to help uh, customers realize that you know, buying an EV uh, is not something that determines who they are, sends a symbol about themselves. It's, it's sort of, it's, it, they have to love the performance of the vehicle. 
uh, and, and be, wanting, be willing to adopt it. Last piece is affordability. Um, and in the IRA, there are uh, credits and incentives for used EVs. That's fantastic. Uh, I was with the uh, Climate uh, Mayor's Conference yesterday. I learned a ton, a ton about how local government looks at EV adoption. Uh, affordability is big. Charging is big, in the, in, especially in marginalized communities and neighborhoods. Um, and it's a desire to see how can also local government sort of uh, acquire fleets of EVs so that the public, the people they serve, see them hmm. and realize, hey, this is a great vehicle. I've got nothing to be worried about. I can jump in and, and, and be a first mover as well with these EVs. So, so a variety of, of points, uh, and, and no one issue is going to solve it. Uh, but I think if we can address infrastructure, perceptions, uh, myths, uh, and, and sort of likability or resonance with the consumer, uh, we'll see EV adoption grow. Yeah, well, that's so interesting. One thing I'm hearing I I implicit in all of that is that, you know, you, you've been meeting customer needs for the history of the, org of, of the, of the company, and it's, you've got to fit EVs into that. It's not a new thing that now it's like this weird, you know, oh, this is going to be a special kind of car for only a special Correct. kind of person. It's how do you make the EVs fit? And, and the performance can be, you know, you, that, that can be appealing. There can be lots of a aspects of that EV performance, but it's got to be broad-based, and, it, and it's got to fit the customer's need. Mm -hmm. um, well, so uh, actually, let me turn back to you. Amazon, of course, both has a huge number of con consumers. I may or may not be an Amazon Premium myself, uh, or Amazon Prime, but, uh, but also a big customer. So how do you think both of your uh, customers' needs and, and, the, and the consumer preferences you see affecting how you all think about your strategy, but also your role as a customer um, in, on the transportation side and elsewhere uh, to drive demand. Well, thank you for maybe or maybe not being a customer. I hope you are. Um, <laughs> we, get, we get enough packages arriving at our building that I'm, yes, yeah, we definitely <laughs> um, Well, that's right. We, Amazon both has our customers. We, we pride ourselves on being the most customer-centric company on earth. And quite frankly, they're demanding that we be more sustainable in addition to getting, having the widest selection, the fastest shipping, um, and you know, the, the greatest range of, of, of options. Um, and we, do, we continue to make strides to make sure we can do that. Mm -hmm. So it's both reducing the weight of our, our packaging options, reducing plastic in our packaging, reducing, um, we now have removed 95% of the air pillows that we used to put inside the package to protect what's inside, now we're moving to recyclable paper. So um, really, the, our customers are demanding that. What we're finding is that in making these improvements, it also uh, improves truck fill rates because mm. the boxes are smaller. Um, it means we, are, we're, we change the structure of our network from one national network to eight regions. What that means is we're putting our inventory closer to customers, mm. shorter stage lengths, means much easier to put electric vehicles into those types of operations. So that's sort of the Amazon, you know, what we're, our value proposition to our customers, who hopefully, uh, those who also may or may not be customers in the audience, hopefully you have seen the uh, electric vehicles that we have on the road today delivering. Um, and I think that's what sort of makes the transition to Amazon as a customer, um, as you said, we're willing and we do uh, pay a green premium in order to either set demand uh, signals and or make investments ourselves. One is in, uh, we made the largest uh, order for electric vehicles. Uh, we will have uh, over 100,000 on the road by 2030. Um, so that's something that Amazon, because of our size and scale, could just do on our own. There's a lot though where we will need partnerships uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about where we can partner and with our collective action drive change. One of the partnerships that comes to mind for me is Zemba, which is the Zero Emission Maritime Buyers Alliance, uh, where we are helping set those demand signals for green shipping. And in fact, we just, they just had their first tender for uh, green shipping that will reduce the, the emissions for that, um, for that service by 90%. And um, so it's going, we can, we can do some of that our own, but as a customer ourselves, we are going to need partnerships to make it possible. Um, 
So I want to I want to pick up on that sort of demand signal point. And, and by the way, I heard something great yesterday. Somebody said we should stop calling it a green premium and call it a scaling premium because that's what it it's really. I mean, partly that's just it's it's to build up the scale that we need at the at the sco speed and scope we need. So you talked about demand. Obviously, demand and creating market demand is critical to providing the finance to go back, Tom, to you. But we also know that if we're going to do that and we're going to rely on market demand, we need to make sure that the goods that are being sold and purchased as low carbon fuels are really low carbon fuels. That's a lot of measurement accounting. Uh, we, without getting too far into the sort of weeds on this, where do you see some of the challenges um, and the importance of getting that kind of accounting and measurement right? And, and how important is that to sort of making sure that the finance is flowing? So this is one of those pain points and it, it causes me physical pain actually um, because it, it's, <laughs> It's a huge inhibitor of investment and progress uh, is arguing over the, the yardstick by which you measure emissions, right? Um, at a certain point, we need to have some degree of humility. We'll never get it exactly right, but we have a pretty good sense of what, what is lower carbon and what isn't. And um, the, the tax credits in the IRA, a number of them, uh, went essentially unused over the past mm. couple of years or, or their usage was diminished in uh, dramatically while the Treasury Department, you know, agonized and, and I, God bless them, they worked hard <laughs> uh, to get some of the rules on, on these methodologies by which you, you measure your life cycle emissions. Um, and that's something I think we need to get over and get over it fast and just say this is the yardstick and, and this is what we're all going to agree to use and that get, will send a clear signal to investors that this is something that is reducing technology, this is, or reducing emissions, this is a technology that is, that is not reducing emissions and we can, we can all agree that that's what's happening. Um, there will always be some ambiguity but we don't need that murkiness inhibiting investment with you know, preventing companies from moving ahead with really important technological advancements while these, these uh, things get sorted out. We can't let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good on this. Mm -hmm. Very important piece, really boring, really nerdy stuff, but nonetheless uh, critical, I think, to, to attracting a lot of the climate investment, whether it's clean hydrogen or, or SAF. Yeah, and I, really, I hear the importance of kind of simplification, standardization, consistency, uh, let's get it as right as we can, but let's get it set and clear and provide some certainty uh, and allow that investment to flow. Lena, you, you obviously talked about fuels as well and yep. low carbon fuel. How, how do you see some of those measurement and reporting issues uh, from your perspective? Yeah, so uh, so actually I'm also head of yeah, ESG, right, and sustainability reporting at Mass, so I know the challenges very well uh, uh, also. Um, <clears throat> but. Um, uh, I completely echo what's been said. I mean, I think we need, uh, on the one, we need standard uh, ways to measure uh, both uh, across the life, cy life cycle of fuels. We need to know that we're uh, comparing the same things. Mask has been involved for many years, actually uh, going back, I think it's over 15 years ago that we were also uh, part of uh, setting up the Clean Cargo Working uh, Group, which was actually also out of a recognition that uh, if we are going to commercialize uh, uh, sustainable, uh, green, or low emissions uh, shipping, um, we need to offer our customers a comparable way of, of, of measuring the, uh, the, the services, uh, obviously. And, uh, and that has since uh, evolved and, uh, and now, of course, uh, is also a, uh, a foundation for, uh, for, for what we're doing. Um, but uh, so, it, so it's critical, we need the, the standardization, but we also uh, need to make sure that indeed it doesn't become a barrier uh, to actually uh, being able to uh, push forward uh, in these, uh, the critical investments that we need. And, uh, um, and, and I would also just uh, echo and support the work that's going on with the Buyers Alliances and, and SEMBA and the other uh, industry uh, initiatives uh, that, we, that we see. One challenge, uh, of course, uh, with that is we also still need some of the, the large uh, standard bodies like the Science Based Target Initiative, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, mm. to also come fully on board uh, here and to recognize uh, that uh, these types of buyers alliances and booking claim systems, mass balance systems, that they're fully recognized 
um, because uh, I know this is uh, something that um, uh, almost uh, every company that I that I talk to and peers and colleagues working with sustainability across uh, across companies, I think there's so many of us who actually are genuinely committed. We want to be able to make progress uh, towards our, our goals, um, but we have to find innovative ways to get there, especially when we look at scope three, uh, our value chains. And um, uh, yeah, so so uh, I'm, I'm kind of both encouraged by all the innovation that I see, but yeah, more needs to be done. Yeah, and I, I was over at the Green Markets Activation Day yesterday, and I know many people were as well, and that was a big theme, was on a panel with Zemba and Saba and so on, and, and one of that themes is, we just gotta get going, and yeah. we, and there, companies that are ready to make investments, you all are already making those investments. How do we provide clear rules of the road but and, and provide some of those guardrails, but make it simple enough that the investments can start to flow? Um, okay, so we, we're down to our last couple of minutes. We started off by asking, you know, what's the headline from the previous year or last year or so? I want to look toward the future and, and hear what you're each excited about that and, and if you can, you know, what's, what's the headline that you're excited about? But you don't, you don't have to put it in that format. But what are you looking ahead to the future? What's, what are you most excited about in terms of progress? And maybe, Tom, I'll start with you and come back this way. 30 seconds each. Sure. Uh, 2016, we were only using sustainable aviation few in, in Los Angeles. Uh, today, we're using it in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago. Uh, Amsterdam and London, and um, looking toward the future, I want this to be what we use in all of our uh, locations. I think it's eminently possible. We've seen an enormous expansion. That's daily usage. Um, we can get there. It's going to take a little bit of time, but that's the future that I'm looking forward to. And this fuel is low carbon, sustainably made, and hopefully domestically produced too, which is exciting. So. Excellent. Uh, exciting for me, pick up off of your, your comment, Tom, is uh, uh, exciting for me will be uh, a next year headlines that uh, we have a, a vastly extensive EV charging infrastructure and that EV volume uh, uh, has uh, increased uh, significantly over 2024. Excellent. Well, for me, uh, obviously, the IMO uh, decision, which we no has to come uh, on the, the carbon prices. So, so in the sense uh, that we will see, I hope, over the next year, that decision, that policy decision, which is, is going to de-risk a lot of the innovation uh, and uh, scaling up of in investments in the green fuels uh, that, we, that we need. And, uh, and then also, yeah, just really, I mean, think back uh, just a couple of years ago, this was uh, when we talk about green fuels for shipping, it was an industry that did not exist. And so uh, there's so much happening in such a short space of time. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about what is gonna be in the future as well. Yes, I'm, I'm equally optimistic. You know, Amazon is, is special in that we are in, as I said, in, in maritime, in aviation, in uh, surface transportation. And so we need a range of options that's gonna help us get to net zero carbon by 2040. These partnerships are, I think the, the investment and time is really going to show some results in the years ahead that I'm excited about. Um, I'm also excited about our recently released sustainability report that showed we uh, reduced overall emissions as our company continues to grow. So we have shown that you can decouple business growth with emissions growth and that sustainable companies are successful ones. And if we can do it, we will continue to help others uh, decarbonize. We're sharing more of the tools and information that we've got with the in, the entire industry, so that others can can follow and we can collaborate. Which is going to be take all of us to to do that. Well, I love ending on a high note, and so thanks for all that. I love those headlines, and I think to get back to this point of collaboration with all the work that you all are doing, your companies are doing, the broader ecosystem folks in this room. We'll be, maybe we'll be reading those headlines in the years to come. So, uh, please join me Thank in welcoming and thanking the panel and the great discussion.